you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Father, thank you for this night, and God, I thank you for your word. Uh, God, I thank you that you speak to us through the word. And so, God, I thank you for just reminders. And uh, Lord, I pray tonight, again, Lord, that if they're just one sentence that makes a difference or gets us thinking, Lord, uh, I pray that that would be so tonight. So God, be with the reading of the Word, and God, just uh, thank you so much for these folks that are so faithful to come uh, pretty much every Wednesday night. So God, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you for this time of Bible study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, I want to talk to you about greatness in, is serving. Greatness is serving. And uh, just a great story here, uh, not taught a whole lot uh, compared to other passages in the Gospels, but let me give you the outline. Uh, number one, the request. All right, we have the request. And the second one is the question. There is a request, there is a question, and number three is the answer. So, you know, a lot of people have different ideas of what greatness is. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, people associate greatness uh, with talent. You know, they're, you know, they have a lot of talent, or sometimes it's sports. You know, some of the, I guess, I guess the saying that has been going on for many years is GOAT, greatest of all time, you know, in different sports. And, uh, you know, the, the thing that we understand uh, or, or should understand is, uh, with Christians is uh, when we think about the greatest of all time, all right, folks, we're talking about Jesus, okay? Uh, he is the greatest, uh, you know, Savior, the greatest Messiah, uh, the greatest. He was a person. He lived here, uh, you know, on earth, and uh, he, was, he truly was the greatest. And so we should always uh, be quick to imitate him, to, to uh, emulate him, uh, to want to be like him. And uh, this, this story here today, you know, he's making a great point. And uh, I think we all need a reminder of that. In Matthew chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 20. The, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him. So the mother of uh, the Zebedee's sons was Salome. And uh, you will remember also later on, uh, she was one of the ladies uh, at the cross. Uh, so she would have been close to Mary and she would have been close uh, to the family. And then Zebedee's sons is James and John. And, uh, you know, when... She kneeled at him. She was showing Jesus respect, okay, for who he was and what he had done. And the phrase is interesting, asking something from him. And, you know, I think if we put that in our language, just simply say uh, she was asking for a favor, okay? And you have to realize when people ask you for a favor, uh, you know, you can't always do everything that somebody wants you to do. You have to, you know, decide, is this right? Uh, you know, should I do this? Uh, you know, I even throw the words, what, what would Jesus do? You know, if I'm in doubt about something somebody asked me to do, but uh, they, they, he, she was basically asking a favor. Then verse 21, and he said to her, what do you wish? And she said, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other one on the left in your kingdom. So that was the request, okay? The favor was, can these, my boys, two of the disciples, sit right next uh, to you? And logically, the first thing I thought about is the three that were closest to Jesus, all right? And Peter uh, was one of those there. So that would have left him out if he granted this. And I don't think, uh, uh, you know, the bigger deal was not, you know, that she had asked, 
But you will see here in just a second, they, she, and I believe James and John, did not understand the full scope of what Jesus was trying to say to them. And what I think was going on here, well, let's look back at, look back at Matthew chapter 19. I think this will open our eyes to why this question came up. Matthew 19, verse 26. And again, you know, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. Uh, he tells him, you know, what, you know, what his issue was. His one issue, all right, as far as we know, kept him out of the kingdom of God, and that was he was rich. He had money, okay? And he'd done many things right according to verse 18. And then it says, you know, uh, all things are possible with God. Uh, and then verse 26 says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And again, he's talking about, can a camel go through the eye of a needle? Which again, that was not the issue there. He was simply saying, it is very hard for a rich man to be saved because they're so self-sufficient. Okay, they've got everything they want. And I, I have... I've only talked to one man that literally in a witnessing situation in Lawton said, why would I need him? I've got everything I want. Okay, and man, that, that was not an easy thing, uh, you know, to answer. And it was out on Evangelist Explosion. You know, we had 22 teams that would go out every Tuesday night. And it kind of caught me, you know, back. And of course, I quickly headed to, you know, what's coming, uh, the judgment, everyone is going to stand before God. And his basic answer to that was, I don't believe that. Okay. So again, you know, I was just caught aback by that, but here's the key here. Look at verse 27. Then Peter answered and said to him, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? And when, when I think about this, you know, Peter was the one that had earlier said, uh, you know, we'll die for you, okay? And I really believe Peter meant that with all of his heart, but Jesus was trying to get him understand. And this is what I think uh, James and John's mother was thinking. I think they were thinking two different things. They were thinking here on earth. You're going you're gonna to come. You told them your kingdom, even though they, he did tell them it's not of this earth. And he tried to tell them, it's the kingdom to come. But I really think, you know, still at this point in their minds, they were thinking, we're talking about ruling right now, okay? And, and then he says, you know, in verse 28, so Jesus said to them, assuredly I say to you, in that generation, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on the thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, what is he talking about? He's talking about the millennium period. Okay, we, we studied this in Revelation. So they, were, they could not understand, Salome could not understand, you know, he's basically saying, hey, when you take over, when this, this happens, let them sit beside you, let them rule. And he was trying to get her to understand, it's not going to be on earth that I am ruling. It was a heavenly thing. Uh, you know, the millennial thing versus the earthly thing. And I really think this comes out later on in his third point. I think you'll see and agree with what I'm saying. Verse 29, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold of an uh, and eternal life. Okay. So he was basically telling Salome, and, and referring to in this life, no, you know, you're not going to have the kingdoms. They're, you know, it doesn't have anything uh, to do with being rich, okay? We're talking in, in the life uh, af after judgment. Verse 30, but many who are first will be last and last first. So there is the first reference to what he is getting to in this particular scripture that we are talking about. She was thinking here and now, and I believe James and John was thinking the same thing, but he was talking about in the future. So that's, that was the request. She did not understand the difference between 
the two. And so that's the request. Number two, the question. Okay? But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. That's why that, that sentence alone made me understand what, what was going on here, or at least helped me understand what was going on here. Because Jesus just told her, you know, we're not, we're not on the same wavelength. Okay? And it says, are you able to drink uh, the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized with? And they said to him, we are able. So what was Jesus trying to say in the drinking of the cup? I believe he was talking about suffering and death. Okay? He had told the disciples several times, even before this point, that he was going to the cross and he was going to die. All right? And like I said, we can refer to Peter again, and, and he just says, hey, hey, Jesus, we'll go with you. All right, we'll go with you. You know, we're ready to die. And of course, we know his epic failure around the campfire of denying Christ three times. Uh, but Jesus wanted them to know that. And then verse 23, so he said to them, you will indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism, which I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not for mine to give, but it's for those whom is prepared by my Father. So he is simply saying, and when you think about, uh, you know, what he is talking about here, if you remember, James was the first Christian martyr. So he was going to, uh, you know, he was going to uh, taste death that way. Okay? And again, John, of course, he was old. He was, he was the one, uh, the oldest, you know, lived the longest, but he was exiled on the Adam of island of Patmos. So again, being exiled away from people by yourself, I mean, it's a form of prison there. So, I mean, there was suffering in what both they did, okay? And so we see that uh, as, as, as we look at what he was talking about. Jesus was just trying to say, you know, you'll, you'll do part of what I am going to do. But folks, they in no way suffered like Jesus suffered, okay? I mean, I mean we've talked about this, I don't, e I don't even know how many times uh, around Easter, uh, the suffering that Jesus went through, the beating of the cat of nine tails, uh, getting punched in the face, uh, the crown of thorns, okay? He suffered and, and truthfully you know, uh, you know, I've read several commentaries that said, you know, it was pretty much a miracle that he even survived the beating. Uh, he was not even identifiable is what one or two uh, writers had said. And then not only had he suffered more than anybody else would suffer, okay, he died, okay? But folks, even in his death, all right, it affected all mankind. Why? Because he did not stay dead, all right? After three days, Jesus arose. So Jesus was just trying to say, I know in your mind you think you know what's going on here, but you probably really, you, you, you don't understand the depth which I am talking about here. You don't understand what I went through for you. And you know the other thing that really hit me this morning as I was going over this? It was the laying on of sin on Jesus. Here's a man that lived 33 years and had never sinned in his life. Folks, we can't even, for us, <laughs> sometimes 33 minutes, you know, is, is, is a, a, you know, a push for some folks. But to realize that every sin of every person that has ever lived was laid upon Jesus, okay? He became sin for us. Second Corinthians 5 says that. And folks, I am telling you, I believe it's verse 21, but, you know, in my mind, I can't even imagine him just knowing, you know, and i tell you another thing that I just come to my mind. Uh, even his father, all right, forsaking him. I mean, for him to cry out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
So even though in their minds they were willing to go through some of these things, I really don't think they gave it as much thought as they should have as what they were asking. And not what they, but mom and, and you know, I'm sure both of them, you know, had an idea of, of what was going on here. And I, I've got to say this, you know, to moms. You know, moms are nurturers. Mom wants the best for their kids, you know, and I, I'm not trying to blame her or, you know, make her look bad or anything. But what she was asking, I truly believe she was not understanding. And sometimes I will say, say this also, you know, that there are situations in our life that we just flat don't understand. Okay. It, you know, you know, I, I hear it, especially in, in death. You know, why, why did uh, my child or why did, you know, my teenager or why did my husband have to die? Okay. And, and again, we have to, in our minds, remember, folks, God always has a plan. There's a reason for everything that goes on in life. So again, he answered the question, basically saying, I know you think you're, you're willing to do this. And, and to a certain point, they did. I mean, they lived the rest of their life for Jesus Christ. James, which again, you know, we are teaching about and we do on Sunday nights. And then John, of course, the last thing we taught was the book of Revelations. They did a good job, but they could not save the world is what I'm trying to say. All right. So we see the request. We see the question. And number three, we see the answer. And when the 10 had heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Greatly displeased, you know, a displeased means they were upset. Okay. And what is that all about? Folks, you know, uh, you can blame it on a lot of things. I think sometimes it's just human nature. You know, they were sitting there thinking, well, that's a pretty bold, you know, request. All right. But yet again, when you think about it, folks, you know, God unites and Satan divides. All right. So again, I, I think part of this is that, okay, Satan was getting in on it as far as this part of it was, because, you know, we should be in tune with our brothers, you know, and, and again, we can, we can disagree with one another, but disagreeing agreeably is the key. Folks, we're both, you know, we're Christians. We ought to be able to sit down in a room and work everything out, okay? So they got very upset about this request, but Jesus called, to, called them uh, to himself and said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Now, why is he, what, did, what did he say about the Gentiles? He was talking about the world. He was saying, this is what the world does. You guys getting mad at one another. You guys wanting to be on, you know, right next to Jesus. Okay? That's what the world does. It's, you know, how much money can you make? How big a house can you live in? What kind of car can you drive? You know, I want everybody to see me. I want everybody to know I'm in charge here. Okay? So Jesus just said, you're just acting like the world, like pagans. Okay? And then it says, uh, verse 26, yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. So this whole conversation boils down to this last two verses. Jesus was trying to get them to understand, all right, I'm leaving the earth. I've got to go. I'm going to die. I'm not going to be here to help you. I'm not going to be here to give you advice. So one of the last things I want you to know, greatness is serving. Okay? And if anybody, you know, followed Jesus at all or knew Jesus' life, you know, even in performing the miracles, he never did a miracle to show off. He did a miracle to meet human needs. And again, it authenticate his life and his who he truly was. But there was always a spiritual connotation or a spiritual meaning in everything that Jesus did. And he came 
and there are several verses that come into my head. Uh, Luke, I believe, 19, verse 10. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came here to be the ser a servant of many. So it says, and whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Even on his cross, it said, King of the Jews. What do kings do? They rule. They rule. But Jesus is saying, that's not who I am. Yes, I am the king, but I haven't come here to rule. I have come here to die, to serve, to give life to others. And folks, in this world that we are living in, I am telling you, it's all about us. It's all about me. It's all about who I am or who I know or what I have. Or, and, and folks, Jesus was never that way. I mean, even the Bible said he didn't even have a place to live. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He slept on the ground a lot of times with a rock as his pillow. But he came to serve. And, and one of the greatest, I'm just telling you, examples was when, you know, you know, they were meeting before the Lord's Supper, and he did something that I believe shocked every one of them. It's when he took a servant's role, put a towel around himself, and washed the disciples' feet. Folks, the lowest, the meaning, the, I mean, the lowest form of a slave did that. The lowest on the bar did that. And if you remember what the what the story in the Bible says, I did this as an example of what you need to do when I'm gone. So folks, I'm telling you, we are more like Jesus when we're serving than ruling over people. And one last scripture, Philippians, Philippians 2. Go with me if you would. Philippians 2, verse 5. Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it to be robbery, to be equal with God. Okay, we know that. All right, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God and Jesus are one. All right, the, the, the Gospels teach us that. Now look at verse 7. But made himself of no reputation. How many times when he was on earth, he healed somebody and said, don't you tell nobody. Don't you tell nobody, okay? Why? Because people that have egos, they want everybody to know, okay? But he'd say, don't you tell anybody. And it says, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. Folks, that word means slave, slave. And coming in the likeness of men, he was just like you and I. I mean, if you pinched him, he felt it. And it says, here it is, and being found in the appearance uh, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What did he do? He served mankind. He, he, I mean, his blood was shed for mankind. And folks, that's what we have to realize, you know, a lot of times we have instances where we could serve and our, our spiritual ears are not up or our spiritual eyes are not open. And here's what I do, and every once in a while, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will just slap me, all right? I do something, and I, 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 there's a situation that just pops up. And, you know, I try to temporary, temporarily do something there, okay? I do something, but yet... I'll get down the road, and the Holy Spirit will say, you did not spend enough time. Even though I'm going on to a shut-in or going on to a hospital or going on to do something else, it's not just about fixing things. It's about investing your life in their life in serving Jesus in the process. So I pray that this will challenge you spiritually, and when you see a time that you can serve, that you will take the opportunity. And folks, I, you know, like I said, you know, there's good, there's better, and there's best. 
okay? And that's true uh, with Christians also. There's good Christians. There's better Christians. And again, it's not one to take, to, to take pride in, but I believe the best ones are here. The greatest ones are those that want to serve. Father, thank you for this story. And God, I just thank you, Lord. It, it, it really isn't a parable, uh, God. It's you speaking to us through the Word. And God, I do pray that we would sometime just slow down and we would think about what people are saying and think about how can I help this situation? How can I make it better? And Lord, sometimes it might make us late for something. But Lord, I truly believe if we can just explain uh, you know, what happened and why we did it, everything would be all right. And God, I'm, I, I am telling myself, God, I just, I just want to be more aware of meeting people's needs and more aware of serving people who are hurting. So God, I thank you for Jesus. And God, I just thank you for, Lord, you talk about greatness and serving. There, there, there is nobody better than him. But God, we want to, we do, we want to be like him. And God, we want to serve. There's so many ministry opportunities. There's so many life situations. And God, I pray that we would just slow down. We would get focused. We would listen to the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that we would become true servants of God. Thank you so much for this reminder tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.